it was such a weird moment a second ago when you're like, she is an investor. Like, I didn't feel like that was part of my identity. Hey, this is Neeti, and what you're about to hear today is a very special episode with one of the members from our portfolio program. We call these Sensei Sessions. These interviews are designed to give you a perspective about what you can achieve with the right strategies and execution. I hope you enjoy this episode, and for free resources, check out our show notes section to see how you can build and scale your portfolio. Angie, welcome to the Sensei Session. Please tell us a little bit about yourself outside of investing. Where do you live? What do you do? Tell us more. Okay, so I am in St. Louis, like smack dab in the middle of the country here. And yeah, I've been in St. Louis for the past, I guess it's been three years. It was just before COVID, which is crazy. That was three years ago now. But yeah, just before COVID, I moved back from Las Vegas. I had lived there for about eight years before that. So been hanging out here. Um, a little about me. I guess I am married to a Finnish man. So we spend time in Finland. I just got back Sunday of this week from being in Finland for about a month. Um, we love to travel. Don't have any kids, so get to go whenever we we feel like, which I feel like is kind of a blessing, right? It's a little bit quieter, a little bit. And I should mention that Angie is part of the amazing Open Spaces team. She is part of the amazing team, um, but she's also an investor, like we all are. So, um, how did you get into this investing world? Okay, first of all, can I just pause and say like it was such a weird moment a second ago when you're like she is an investor. Like I didn't feel like that was part of my identity until you just said it, but I guess yeah, I am an investor, right? Like I own two doors now and so cool. That's that's a really cool moment of like I guess that is part of my identity. I wouldn't ne necessarily say that, but mm -hmm. um how did I get into it? I kind of feel like it just it kept knocking on my door, like it just kept coming around and the idea just kept being there and life kept putting opportunities in my path. And I was like, no, no, no. But then I started working with Pollock, who, you know, big shout out to you, Pollock, you're amazing, like a year and a half ago. And I was helping other people get into investing. And prior to that, I had been insuring properties. I was an insurance agent for a long time. And I thought, well, maybe I should try it. You know, maybe maybe this would be something that I should do. And then I started looking at the numbers and the calculations and to be completely transparent with you guys, after a few months of bringing people into the program, I started realizing like these people all have properties. These people that I was talking to three months ago now have two doors and they're moving forward in life and I'm still thinking about moving forward in life. And so mm. that's kind of how I, I got into it, I guess. Man, that's so good because you, I mean, you're in the Kool-Aid, right? You're you're all you hear about is this and Pollock's program and Niti's program. And still it took you a little bit of time yeah. to make the jump. It did. It was, did. I, that's like embarrassing for me because I'm like, why no. don't I, you know? No, 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 no. So do you think that there was one thing maybe? And we're gonna we're and by the way, we are gonna dive into her deal. You have two doors now, so her deals and all of that. But like, was it maybe one thing that you can remember that was like, maybe it was someone you talked to, maybe it was a module. Was it one thing that maybe you remember? I will tell you a really pivotal, like, I need to get off of the fence and like light a fire under my own decision making here. I had been thinking about it and looking at the market and I had like my toes in the water, like I'm going to do this. But there was no set date or goal or anything in mind. And there is a really lovely couple. I don't see them in the group today. But at some point um, last year, as I was bringing them in, and I won't say their names so that way it, it remains anonymous, when we were speaking, they, they were at retirement age and had filed bankruptcy like six months prior to that. And they were looking at getting a property and needed to catch up on retirement income and knew like the only way to do it was real estate, but wasn't sure. And they just like had all this fear because of the bankruptcy and, and different things in their life that are, you know, personal. And they went out on a limb. They joined the community. And I swear to you, I'm not making this up. Like within 30 days, I saw her in the community posting how she was under contract on a place. And it was this moment for me where I was like, okay, if this these people who are much older than I am and so much more to lose than me and all the odds stacked against them can take this risk for themselves. I think that I certainly can take a little risk and stop, you know, wondering about what it would look like or thinking maybe I will do it in the future and just actually do it. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a big thing for me. 
Yeah, and that's good. I think we always think too, we need to learn more. Like yeah. we need, we need a, just a little bit more and the modules are fabulous. So I'm not saying that there's not amazing gold in there, but sometimes I think in my head that we need to go over the modules again before we can do more. Like we need to do it three or four times. And I feel like um, that, that leap of faith that Pollock talks about yeah. is the part that you, you're just like, okay, I'm going to do it. Yeah. There's also at some point too, um, I was talking to a friend who has an online business and he was like, it doesn't have to be perfect to make money. And we were talking about a different situation. And I yeah. kind of realized that that's so relevant in this world too. Like I had felt that I needed to find the perfect place with the like mm -hmm. highest profit margin and the most cash flow. And like it was going to fit this fantasy in my mind about what investing had to look like for me. And then I realized it doesn't have to be perfect. Like it doesn't have to make the most cash flow ever. It doesn't have to, it just needs to be a deal. And I just need to get out there and start doing it. You know what I mean? I love it. I love it. And our pro Kimberly Campbell agrees. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect to make money. Okay. I want to call your burr like the Swiss army knife burr. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I like that. Did I just make that up? The Swiss army knife burr. Okay. Love so that. where, I know I love that too, um, but let's get to it. Where, where you live in St. Louis, Where's your burr, your first one? Where it is here in St. Louis. If you're familiar with the area at all, it would be like uh, Francis Park, Lindenwood Park area. So it is probably um, an A or B neighborhood. Um, not what you would typically look for, but because we are living in it, that was like one of the benefits of being able to house hack and do the burr at the same time. We got to be a little bit pickier and we got to go a little bit higher on budget than versus something that you're not living in, if that makes sense. Okay. So you are house hacking, you're burring. Yes. And, and what else? There's something else with it too, isn't there? House hack, burr, and we're going to do a midterm rental in the other unit. So, mm -hmm. uh, okay. you know, traveling nurses yeah. and furnished finder versus a long-term tenant. Okay. So let's talk, how, how did you... I, I, and I know you know the area, so you probably picked it because you know the area. Is that is that kind of where it is? What got, let, let's talk about like the money part of it. So you said it was more than maybe yeah. what you would think in a like in an investment kind of burr. Let's yeah. talk about that money part mm -hmm. and how you came to terms with that and how you figured out like what the right price was. So let's kind of go through like why you chose the neighborhood you did specifically and how you came upon. It's a duplex, right? Yeah, it is a duplex. Um, so first and foremost, we were looking to purchase a property to live in at the same time as a Burr property. So it ultimately meant that we were going to purchase two separate pop properties and looking at doing conventional financing for this, which leaves you with a down payment that you have to use, and then hard money lender and you know construction costs and everything over here. So it was like juggling two separate things. And I realized at some point if we could combine the two of them, we would actually be out less out of pocket. Oh, yeah. It would be to do both at the same time. And we would build the value faster. But also our cost of living was really important to us because if we can lower it down to zero or close to zero, then we can travel more. And we don't have to worry as much about being out of the country and, and things yeah. like that. You were really looking at your lifestyle mm -hmm. or overseas lifestyle too because of yeah. the just what you do in your day to day. Okay. Yeah. So care to share numbers? You're, you've talked about your your neighborhood, of course, and we'll talk about the numbers, but I want to go, actually, I want to go back a little bit too. Um, who'd you get help with to, to find this? Like, did you find it on your own? Did you kind of drive by neighborhoods? I mean, I have my aunt as a real estate agent, so I'm super oh, right. lucky. She's been a real estate agent for 20 something years. Now, she is not, um, I mean, she is amazing and wonderful and she really helped us a ton. But she, like if I was to go online and circle like or Google investing real estate agent, she probably wouldn't come up because she deals more with traditional real estate. And so we had not been working with her because we were trying to look at wholesale houses mm -hmm. and things like yeah. that, which in St. Louis, it wasn't in neighborhoods that we would live in. It was like neighborhoods that do have a high crime rate and you could probably get like good tenants who are good, honest people, you know, but it wouldn't necessarily be a place that I would be comfortable like being out of the country for a month and leaving vacant kind of thing. 
So uh, when we decided we were running the numbers on the calculator and we were like, well, if we live in half of a unit, like if we house hack it, all of a sudden these other numbers fall into place. The cash flow becomes really high, but also the retirement value and like the value we build over time becomes much higher. Then we reached out to my aunt and my aunt started looking for us. <laughs> That's great. And so you're using truly your network. Like, yeah. You're truly oh, yeah. on Okay. How network. much did you buy it for? How, what was the purchase price? Yeah, the purchase price was four hundred and one four hundred one. And then, what are your your thoughts for the rehab and then the ARV and yeah, and what you might get as a midterm for the other one. I will tell you what we ended up doing is conventional lending because we could go three and a half percent down, and then the cash that we had on hand was enough to finish the renovation. So no interest on the cost of the renovating. Three and a half down under our name, and then tee up for a refinance under the business name in six to twelve months. And since we're living here, we felt comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. um, also, that just kind of opened some doors as far as like you know programs. Like as an example, the zip code we moved from was like a downtown trendy loft area. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out the state gives money to people, no income cap by the way, to people yeah. moving out of that zip code. So we got to capitalize. Yeah because the loan was under our name as well. So talking to like a solid mortgage broker was super, super helpful because they were able to educate us on if you do it this way, you will get yeah. more money back. Well, let's go back to that. So you're more, you're more. I mean, like, because it sounds like a great program and Pollock says this is a great strategy. How do you find out about those things? You're, who's your mortgage broker? Is it, of course, somebody local? Yeah, yeah. You have to have somebody who's willing to share this information with you or just sort of is knowledgeable. Has to be knowledgeable. Um, the broker we used was a referral from my aunt. His name is Scott Chaffman. He's amazing. He is at Guild Mortgage, and so it's a large organization. Um, but ultimately, he was able to sit down. We went to coffee at a Starbucks, and we were like, this is what we want to accomplish. We want a portfolio. We don't want to work You know, in five years. We want to be done with that. We want to get approximately this many properties, probably like 15 to replace it. And um, we want to do it the smartest way. And so he's like, well, here are your options, right? And he goes through like, this is what a loan like this would look like. This is what you're going to qualify for with your credit and your history and things like that. This is what you're going to qualify for this way. If you want like a government assistance loan, this is what that would look like. Here are the programs that are available and things like that. And he went through it all. He even went through things that he couldn't do. Um, he was like, here's what an HML path is going to look like for you. Here's what you're going to pay according to this quote that you had gotten from them. Here's where you're going to be better off if you use them. Here's where you're going to be worse off, you know. And so he really sat us down. And to be honest, that coffee was like an hour and a half, two hours of questions, answers, et cetera. But when we left, it was like very clear this would make us the most money in the long run. I liked your vision, first of all. Like, I love it. 15 properties minimum, yeah. right? I love that. And it's and so much more doable with the duplexes, though, because I guess it's like it's not 15 transactions anymore. It's like, you know, seven transactions. Seven or eight. Yeah. yeah. Right. OK, so he gives you all of this. What did you leave that feeling? Like, I, you know, I'll be honest, I was so excited, but so terrified still. Like, this is yeah. going to be awesome. But oh, my God, are we making the right decision? Right, right. Okay, so you buy it for four hundred one thousand. Mm -hmm. um, is there a lot of rehab to be done, or did you need rehab? Okay, no. So the it's upstairs, downstairs, and the upstairs is three bedroom, one bathroom, fourteen hundred square feet. The main level is two bedroom, one bathroom, fourteen hundred square feet, and then there's the basement. And the upstairs is what I would consider tenant ready. So there could be things that we could do to improve, but it has had a soft renovation on it already. That's another thing. Because of us living in the other unit, we were able to get something that was closer to the end game. And a lot of people don't want to live in a multifamily. This house, believe it or not, everyone's going to be like, no, there's no way. But like, Believe it or not, it went on the market in October of 2022 at 475000 It sat on the market until we purchased it in July of this year. Oh, so I thanks. know that a lot of people are like, oh, you can't get anything on the market. Yes, you can. You just have to know where to look and get a good agent who can uncover some of those, those stones. Yeah. I think the market has turned, honestly. So, um, and when did you close? Is this recent that this all happened? So recent, Gerald. Um, July 19th. Oh, wow. So you are in your home. You are 
in the process of what part of it? Like what part of you are you in the process? <laughs> um, I'm like, I say that I look past the screen and the kitchen is this like construction zone. So I let's oh. call it the, the piece of the process, the messy middle. <laughs> gotcha. So when you're talking about the, the, the part to be rented out, that one is actually okay. You're actually living in the burr. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. You know, for four weeks, we were out of the country. So it did from July 19th until now, four of those weeks, we were not here to do anything on. We Uh have the furniture to furnish the upstairs unit. So we have a moving team that's going to move the furniture and any additional things that we're going to purchase will get delivered. But it should go on the midterm market, I would say, in the next two weeks or so. And what do you think it could go for? So midterm, if you could explain how that works Uh and what you're anticipating yeah, monthly or weekly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're going to rent it for about 2500 a month. And a midterm rental is something that is 30 days or more, but usually less than 12 months. And most of the midterm contracts are going to be something like three months long. Wow. And um, a lot of them will be traveling nurses or business professionals. Um, another market that I didn't realize until recently is insurance claims. So people that can't live in their home because of water damage, fire damage, et cetera, The insurance company pays for them to live in a furnished property that's like their other one until um, their property is repaired. But um, the thing with the insurance is a lot of that is families. Mm -hmm. And so they have a hard time finding a three bedroom place, which the upstairs unit is three bedrooms, because a lot of rentals, you know, midterm are going to be a one or two bedroom to accommodate traveling nurses and professionals. So it's kind of I didn't know it, but a little bit of a gold mine up there. right? Right. Your aunt did a great job. You did a great job, really. really So when you're thinking about like an ARV, is that like different because there's not as much? Well, actually, you're doing some rehab for sure, but you're looking at maybe a little bit differently. We are because the unit we are renovating is the unit that we are living in. And yeah. so we're okay with a slow and steady renovation in this one because we're going to, we're willing to live here for a year. Um, yes. So we're probably spending more money on the renovation than we initially budgeted, but also living here, our cost of living every month is essentially $500 when the other one is rented out. You might as well say it's free. I don't know anything that's that cheap and in, in anywhere that you can get it. So our cost of living is so low that the money we would spend every month somewhere else, like on a normal mortgage or rent, I think I look at it as a savings. Like we are saving two thousand dollars by not renting or being in a different mortgage by living here so then that's an additional twenty four thousand that whole year that if you put that into renovations you would have spent it either way gosh congratulations now you said you had another one am i right do you have another the two doors that's these two that's enough right for right this moment and so what happens now Are, are you looking currently or is this kind of the you're trying to get to 15 doors at some point in the future yeah but what's happening right now in the process looking because i think rental properties are like crack like all of a sudden i have one and i want a lot of more <laughs> who agrees with that somebody if they agree with that please put up that much <laughs> um rental properties are like crack interesting well you do it and you know what the hardest most scariest thing was just making the decision and then when that is done and that decision is out of the way i just kind of feel like not all the fear there's still fear i don't want to say that it's like i'm fear free but a lot of that fear is gone and now i'm just like i have to do this either way if i don't get 15 properties the alternative is i will work for somebody else probably for the rest of my life and is that terrible no am i gonna like show up and die no probably not but like I want the freedom. I want the time freedom so badly. I want to be gone and I make the same amount of money whether I'm on a beach sipping coconuts or at home in in a property, right? Mm -hmm. So I I don't feel like there's an option anymore. Whereas before I got the first one, it was still an option to back out. Now there's no option. Now I'm I'm on the path. Like you're in, like you're totally in. Are you surprised by yourself at all? I'm just wondering how decisive you are in other aspects of your life. And then this one maybe was a surprise or not in one way or the other, that you were not as decisive in the beginning, but now you are. Like, has any of this surprised you about you? So many things. Um, I'm not that decisive. Like, if I go shopping, I will go and I'll look at the things and then I'll leave with nothing and then I'll go back and look at that. I will again. do that too. Yes. Yeah. And it's then I do friend, but the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, so I am surprised by the decisiveness, but I'm also more surprised of like, I don't know, I guess overcoming like hard scary you just kind of like i respect myself more 
you know, I, I got out of the thinking about doing and I am doing like you, you called me an investor earlier in this conversation. Mm -hmm, sure. You're not wrong. Right. But like before that, I was only thinking about being an investor until I signed. I wasn't an investor. And so now it's kind of this thing where like I am surprised I'm not a thinker anymore. I'm a doer. Mm -hmm, definitely. I want to kind of tie it back to the modules, though. I know in the beginning we talked a little bit about, OK, well, you know, sometimes we can spend time and I'm planning on myself here studying and analyzing and rewatching things. But they're also very beneficial. So are there things in the program's modules that helped you in particular to tactically get to where you are right now? Things in particular that you remember you used? Spreadsheets, huge. The numbers, the calculators. I feel like that taught me how not to lose money on a deal. It was there were several properties that fit my little Angie fantasy about what it would be so nice to renovate and what it's going to look like after it's done, but they did not fit the spreadsheet. And I heard like Pollock's voice in my head from the stuff that I watch. And she's like, if the number, we let the numbers tell us. And I would be like, that's right, Pollock, we let the numbers tell us. And so like, there goes that, you know, burst that bubble of that fantasy. It's gone, right? But like that spreadsheet to calculate everything was super beneficial. In fact, I remember at one point I pulled it up and I was talking to my aunt. She's like, where'd you get this? She's been in real estate for like 25 years. She's like, where'd you get that? You know, and I'm like, oh, it's from Pollock. This program is amazing. You should refer your clients to it if they're looking at investing, you know, but I think that was super powerful there. Oh, yeah. That, that is so good. It's like she's talking to you through the videos, right? Don't do that, right? You, Paul, like, is talking to you through these videos. Like, don't do that deal because the numbers are not working. What else? What other What other parts of the program specifically? So if people are in this spot, right? If they're like, okay, I'm, I'm like really close to getting to that next step or I'm really close to making those phone calls where they can go to refer knowing that it has helped you. Okay, can I tell you one that's maybe not conventional, but I will yeah, tell you for sure. Oh, so when I was like getting close to the decision making process, I went into this like shutdown period where I was trying to ignore the Facebook group and the podcast and the, you know, private modules and things like that. I was trying to pretend they didn't exist because I knew there was this like monkey on my back, like I needed to make a decision. But the algorithm got me so good, I couldn't ignore it, right? Like it was there, the group was in front of me so much. And I didn't for maybe I'm not gonna say the first time in my life, but you know, for one really pivotal moment of my life, I didn't back down. Like I did face those things. I didn't run away from the information or run away from the trainings. I I kept going. And I think because the information was just so there and there was so much like support and I kept seeing all these other people getting properties that I was almost in a position of like, I can't not do it now. Like I can't ignore it. The monkey's there. It's on my back. I can't just push this to the side and pretend I never saw the information. The veil's been lifted. It is what it is. Now I have to go forward. It's like the positive peer pressure. Yeah. I want to talk about your construction. I know that yours is not the conventional. Actually, your burr is not really that conventional either. But um, but you are in construction. So let's talk about that. And I know you said it's kind of like an expanded timeline. It's not like it's got to yeah. be done like three weeks or whatever. Um, how did you find those people? How did was it through your aunt, or how did you find the people who you have come to trust? I just asked for referrals all the time, like friends and family. When I was purchasing this house, people were so forthcoming with information. Like any friend or family member, I showed. I remember I showed one of my girlfriends the Zillow, and she noticed that the cabinets upstairs, which they're super cool, you guys, but they're like the 1940s metal cabinets. The whole kitchen has them, cool. and really good and she's like oh I know somebody who just got their metal cabinets powder coated and the powder coating looks amazing and it was a pretty good deal and I'm like oh can you you know get the contact information so then she reaches out to her other friend who gets the information etc and so then all of a sudden I have this really warm referral and pictures to somebody else who did a good job and so like that happened I showed another friend the pictures and it's wood floors in here we've already had them refinished but she's like oh yeah we refinished one set on our own and then we hired somebody for the second one and I can't recommend enough hiring somebody because this guy's price was lower than the other bids we got and he did a really good job can I get his info and so then he ended up coming and sure as anything to refinish you know 1400 square feet of, of wood floors he charges us $2,100 done right like yeah. amazing so those types of referrals and just talking to people about what's happening in your life and the property that you're purchasing you would be shocked at what comes out of the woodwork and how helpful people want to be i think 
what you just said is so key because I think we like to think we're running this race alone or we want to run it alone or we think we have to run it alone. And you did not do that. You were like, I think you're probably pretty verbal. Yeah. <laughs> I let people know. <laughs> totally. Like, so that was um, such a good thing. Like they were, were they surprised? Were your people surprised when you said what you were doing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, in some ways it was really good. Sometimes we got bad advice. Like a lot of people that had fear of risk. Yes. Know, my parents, who I love dearly, they're amazing people. They're like, they just want the best for me. But, you know, it's all about stay safe and stay in your comfort zone, et cetera. And so there were certain people that we would talk to and they'd be like, are you sure you want to do that? How about the people that talk about the market? So many of them is now the, the right time to buy. They've been saying that for like years, ever since I started in Europe. Mm -hmm. and so it just like never changes with them. But then some of the other people would be super motivational, like, oh, I just listened to this podcast. I've been thinking about doing that myself or my own, you know, dad owns 10 properties. That's my goal, too. And like you would just start. And the more I spoke about it, the more it tied me to it. So then people would see me again and be like, what's the situation with the property? And now I can't back out because I already told all these people I'm buying a, a duplex. Right. Even before we found it, I had committed myself and I wasn't going to be embarrassed in front of my friends or family by becoming a failure. No, I love that. I love that because I think um, the natural inclination is to, you know, not let people into the world. I mean, it really is. And what you're, and you just, yeah, and got so much out of it. I mean, you have powder coated cabinets now because of that, right? <laughs> and it was scary. Don't get me wrong. It's like scary because you're saying out loud you're starting a business and doing an investment which is it sounds like this giant mountain that you can never climb and I was like a little afraid to tell people like what if I fail and then I'm so embarrassed but like at the end of the day I don't know if I would have kept going and actually made the decision and signed on the line if it wasn't for going so far down that road to where I felt like I can't turn back now too many people know and we've talked about it too much if somebody were to come to you, maybe somebody here in this community is just starting out, and we've got several folks who have just gone through the modules and have just gone through the modules and are maybe, you know, collecting numbers to call or text or whatever, and are maybe like hesitant, like you or, you know, over many months ago, how, how would you help them get over that, that fear? Now you, I mean, you did, you, we've, we've heard what you've done, you know, as far as like speaking it out loud and making sure other people know and holding yourself accountable because you've made it verbally, you know, you've put it out there verbally. But what would you say to somebody else who's kind of maybe in that, like, I'm not sure, I'm stuck still phase? I think that there's a little bit of swallow the frog that has to happen. And um, there's a thing called call reluctancy. Like when you have to call the mortgage people, the insurance people, and you have this list of things that you have to do and you start going, whew, that's intimidating. I'll do that tomorrow. And then tomorrow happens and it was a really busy day and you're not in a good mood because you got an argument with your husband or whatever. And you're like, I'll do that on Saturday. And Saturday comes and then pretty soon you get like a week or two weeks out from when you were just going to do the thing. And then it's kind of like starting a diet where you're like, whatever, I don't even want to be skinny. You know, like it's not like I love that. <laughs> but really, if you just did it the first day, if you just like swallow that frog and make the calls. That's how I got through reaching out to my people and doing it. It wasn't postponing because I postponed it a million times, you know, like there was a lot of times where I was going to do that tomorrow and it didn't happen for, you know, six months later. I, I finally took care of everything. But I think if you just go on that path and you start doing it the minute you need to do it, like fill out the calculators, start looking at properties, start running the numbers, do it, even if it's hard and scary and different. Just do it and get it done with. So that way you can say that it's done. So what's next for you? I, I mean, we know big vision. Like, Yeah. I think the, the closest thing is to finish this kitchen remodel, which should be done in the next two to four weeks. Get the other unit rented. Refi into the LLC name. Um, and then I'm... I mean, we're going to rent the place to ourselves. So if there's any accountants on here, there's a strategy or talk to your accountant about it because I can't say much about it. But anyways, we're going to rent it to ourselves, get that paperwork all done, and then get into the next place, which we are looking. We're open to purchasing now. And we're 100% using Pollock's hard money lender strategy, like the commercial financing for the next one. We, we're not going to keep putting them under our name. I think that's a risk to do that. So 
getting finished with this one and getting into the next one. I mean, the sooner the better. Both my husband and I are so aligned now that we want to try to do four, one a quarter for the next year. About that, like your husband and you, um, how did you get to that place where you were aligned? And by the way, before you say that, you sound like an investor. Like, who agrees? Like, wow, that was excellent. <laughs> but, you know, when you, so, you know, sometimes that is part of the issue. And sometimes you have couples that are completely aligned. Maybe you have one that's more into it than the other. And that yeah. can cause some issues. How did you get to that point where you're both like, okay, we're going to do this, 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 and this. So how did that help us, um, help us as far as couples kind of get to that place, if you wouldn't mind? We researched together and independently. And I was like 150% sold on Burr and the strategy. And then at some point I realized he wasn't, but he also hadn't been looking at the modules or listening to the videos or anything like that. And so then I was like, here's some homework. You know, can you please go look at this? I'm so passionate about it. Like, I'll do it. At some point, I think I, I mean, this is probably a year ago now, but I was like, I need to have these properties in my life, like with or without you. And I would love to do it with you. But like, if I can't, then I'm just going to have to figure out a way on my own. And I think that for him, it was like, okay, well, if you're that passionate about it, mm -hmm. I better, you know, be a supportive partner and get on board. But then once he started researching and listening and watching um, Pollock's videos and things like that, he started getting more and more passionate. And then all of a sudden he was the one that was like, we got to do this and we got to get this many properties. And, you know, it was like, then we were both motivating each other, which was the amazing. But in the beginning, it was not like that. I felt like he looked at me like I had three eyes and was like, you want, you know, 20 properties? You want 15 properties? I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay. But then he got on board eventually. I love what you said about having him go go through modules. I I don't know about you, but my husband, if I said watch some modules and then football was on, the football would win. But I love how somehow, you know, maybe just because of your passion and your excitement, and maybe he was kind of like, what is she talking about? what is she doing with my money? Like all of that maybe is what made him also go into the modules and, and, and then kind of understand. Yes. Yeah. That was absolutely true. The passion. And then now it's like so funny because I was just talking to Pollock about this the other day. He has like subscribed to the podcast. He's like, there's a new podcast out. Did you know? I'm like, of course I know. But like he thinks, you know, like he was the one with the big idea and he's so in the loop. But yeah, he wasn't he wasn't so on board at first. I think he, it wasn't that he wasn't on board. He it was just so foreign to him, and he he was thinking like, is this a crazy idea? Is this just a phase? You know, is this even real life? It sounds too good to be true. I think that was a, a little bit of what he thought for a while. But yeah. now now he's super on board. We joke about it all the time. When we got dressed to go sign the documents, he's like, do I look like a real estate investor? And we were like laughing about how we looked that day, and it's fun. Absolutely love that.